Finally, if we look at male competition in terms of sperm competition, this is if females mate with many males, then there's often competition between sperm within the female, right? So if a female mates with three different males, receives a sperm from three different males, now there's a mix of different sperm, and those males are effectively competing with each other after the mating event has occurred. So of course, the most straightforward way to engage in sperm competition would be just to produce more sperm, so there's more of a chance, and we saw this earlier when we looked at testes size in a polygamous species, in a species where there's very little competition, and then the species does not have as much competition as chimpanzees, but appears to have more competition than gorillas. Another form of sperm competition involves mating plugs. So this is seen in many species where what males will do is after they've inserted the sperm, they'll then insert a chemical that hardens and acts like a, a plug. So when I was a graduate student, but I worked in a mouse lab where we would put a male and a female in the cage together overnight, and in the morning we would want to be able to figure out if the female had mated with the male. And the way to do this is to take a probe, insert it into the uh, vaginal opening of the female, and if you could feel a plug that's kind of like a, a lump of Elmer's glue, you would know that the male had mated with her, because he would have injected his sperm and then plugged up her opening. And this is a strategy that mice have to compete with one another, because the first male to mate has now made the female unable to receive sperm from future females, at least for several hours. These plugs are also seen in Drosophila. Different strategy actually comes from honeybees, where when the males are mating with the female, the penis will actually break off, and in fact this is kind of explosive. So the Greeks actually knew about this. They would notice that when beehives erupted with the females flying up and the males would chase after them and mate with them, you could actually audibly hear pops in the air as males detonate. And it's advantageous to the male because he's never going to mate with another female, but by leaving the penis inside the female, he prevents other males from mating afterwards. In bed bugs, these guys here, we actually see in different species a number of different versions of this. So mating plugs um, were evolved. And some other species, the males evolved what's known as traumatic copulation, where if the reproductive opening of the female is plugged up, males evolved essentially sharp, pointy penises that could pierce straight through the body cavity of the female, and they didn't need an opening, so it didn't really matter if the opening was plugged up or not. The penis can pierce straight into the female. Females, in response, ended up evolving an organ to help them heal from these attacks. In other species of bedbugs, well, once you've got a weapon that's involved in mating, and you have a large group of individuals all trying to mate with a female, it's actually noticed in the species that males will stab each other, and this is now, this penis has become a weapon. And then because you can actually recover from these stabbings, there are other species where there will be males that have the color pattern of females. They get stabbed by males. Those other males exhaust their sperm on these males. And then when an actual female shows up, the male that has not been stabbing other males is the only one with a full supply of sperm to inseminate that female. So in bedbugs, we really have quite a, a wide range of adaptations involved in this sperm competition. A form kind of analogous to mating plugs, but not where there's a physical plug, a form of behavior called mate guarding, uh, similar to this. So in mate guarding, what happens is the male will stay with the female after sperm delivery, and that prevents additional males from having access to the females. So when you learned about frogs, you learned about amphlexis, where the male kind of gets in that headlock position with the females, the female deposits the eggs, the males deposit the sperm. It's often seen that those males like keep holding on to the females for hours and hours and hours, and that prevents other males from doing the same thing. Mate guarding is seen in crustaceans and insects and other species. There's even evidence for it in humans. Psychology studies have shown that in relationships like this, during the part of the month when the female is fertile, that's the part of the month where males are more likely to give unsolicited gifts and are more likely to stay at home and watch a movie instead of going out with the guys. And that's a form of mate guarding, right? Because if you stay at home, the female can't get impregnated by a different male. Maybe other times of the month when she's not fertile, going out with the guys is not so bad because the female can't get impregnated. So there's interesting evidence from a field called evolutionary psychology that some of these sorts of processes that we see in other organisms, we also see in humans, right? Red color patterns, mate guarding behaviors, for example. Another form of sperm competition would be to prevent additional sperm, but not by a plug, 
but by actually physically damaging the female to the point where she will be unable or unwilling to accept further matings. So this picture here is the penis of a bean weevil, and you can actually see a variety of spikes and things here, and that's not a, mis that's not a mistake, that's not an accident. These penises are designed to damage the females to the point at which they won't mate with any other males. For the male, this is advantageous, right? Because he is reducing his competition from other males. To the female, this is not advantageous because it's actually damaging her and may actually be life-threatening. But whether that's a good or bad adaptation, this thing here, it depends on the point of view, right? From the male's perspective, this is an adaptation that leads to increased fitness for the males. For the female's point of view, this is an adaptation in the males that leads actually to lower fitness for females. Some species chemicals in the ejaculate or the sperm um, that alter the behavior of females. So some Drosophila have semen that contains chemicals that lower female libido, actually causes them to mate less in the future. Actually acts as a spermicide, killing sperm that is already there. Causes the females to lay more eggs than they ordinarily would, which causes their survival perhaps to be lessened because they're putting more energy into reproduction. But again, from the point of view of the male, if the female lays more eggs using his sperm and then has less of a chance to survive to have a second set of eggs with a different male sperm, that's positive for the male, right? Because it's producing more offspring with its own sperm. It's not selected at all to be beneficial for the female. And so in fact, it turns out a lot of these things, in fact, are poisonous for the females. And in some really interesting experiments, if you allow males to evolve and have them compete against each other, but prevent females from evolving in response to kind of keep up with this sort of process, you can actually get in the lab to the point where male ejaculate will be so toxic it'll actually kill the females before they can really reproduce. Obviously that's a dead end that we can see in a lab. It doesn't happen in nature because females do evolve in response. So you actually end up with this sort of arms race back and forth between females and males where males are evolving things like this or things like this and females are evolving in response in order to survive and handle those sorts of things. Removing previous sperm is one of the things that penises can sometimes do. This is a Drosophila penis here, and of course they have hooks and barbs too, but this thing here is actually like a little scoop or a spoon that is designed by natural selection over a large number of generations, where the males that had these scoops were better at removing sperm from the females than males that did not. Those males with those scoops did better, so those scoops became an adaptation for these species of Drosophila. When the male mates, first this structure removes the previous sperm, the spikes help the structure stay in if the female becomes unwilling, and then after that, the male deposits his own sperm after removing the previous male's sperm. Another form of sperm competition is males can actually sometimes sabotage other males. So this is a picture from a video that you can find on the website. These are salamanders, and when you watch the video, you'll see that this individual here is actually the male. It's going to deposit a package of sperm, and then this female is going to move over and essentially squat down on it to take in this spermatophore. So this is the male, this is the female, and that's how reproduction works in salamanders. So it turns out in some cases, there will be males here that will come up, they'll kind of touch another male in the right way to convince it that it's a female. This male will then deposit his spermatophore, and this male would just walk away. So what he's done is he's sabotaged this male, right? This male has now left his spermatophore on the ground. This male still has his, so then when a female shows up, this is the one that can actually mate with the female. This one's out of luck until the next day or something. Sabotaging other males also occurs in acanthocephalon worms. So in these guys, they have mating plugs, but what's seen in these species is that they can actually plug other males. So a male will kind of go alongside another male, it'll release the chemicals that normally act as mating plugs onto other males on their genitalia and it glues them up, causes them to be unable to mate when the female does show up or when a female is discovered. And we know this isn't a mistake because when they mate with females, they deposit the sperm and then the plug. When they do this to other males, they don't deposit the sperm first and then the plug, they just do the plug. So in this case, these male worms, they in a sense, know what they're doing. They are deliberately sabotaging other males rather than mistaking them for females. In red-sided garter snakes, they mate in mating balls where there's a 
female who attracts the attention of a lot of males. A large number of males gather around her, writhing in a big mating ball um, to mate with her. Turns out that when you actually take these mating balls and kind of pull all the snakes apart and look at the one in the middle, about 15% of the time the one in the middle is actually a male that's giving off female pheromones. So basically a male in disguise as a female, and what's happening is all those other males in the mating ball, they're being sabotaged, right? They are attempting to mate, they're releasing sperm, they're suffering the damage that being in these mating balls um, can incur, and then when a female's around, these males in the middle will be less damaged and will have a more full supply of sperm with which to mate. And then a final form of sperm competition uh, we can think of is removing previous offspring. So for example, if a male is with a female, but the female has a, a, young, a young baby that needs to be nursing or something, the females typically won't mate while they're caring for the young, and they may in fact not be fertile while they're lactating. And so what happens in some species, so in langurs and in lions, when a new male or set of males takes over a pride or a group, the first thing those males will do is they'll go around to the kill all the babies. That will cause these females to stop lactating, become sexually receptive, and then those males will be able to mate. So they're effectively competing with the sperm from the previous set of males who mated, got the females pregnant, generated offspring, but by eliminating those offspring early, those males are essentially doing sperm competition just at kind of a later stage. So if we actually think about what would have happened in Lion King when uh, Scar takes over the pride, he would not, have, would not have allowed him to live. In lions, the babies get killed. The course website also has a video here, and this is not for the faint of heart. This is a video showing a male lion and how he treats baby lions just after taking over the pride.